Hey everybody, it's Crypto Anarchist here, and I want to uh, basically do a quick summary of this video by Peter Risen. It's a really great video, and he, uh, he explains how um, SPV wallets work. If you want to watch the video, uh, you can see the title in this picture right here. Just skip to about 18 minutes and 14 seconds, a, a little bit before where I have it in this video. But uh, that's when the technical discussion begins. I'm pretty sure this video has no views because the first 18 minutes are they're not that good, so I think most people turn it off before they get to the actual meat and bones of the uh, video. Um, but it's a great video, so I wanted to uh, share it with everybody. You might want to watch it yourselves. Um, I, I, if you understand the basics of it, I would uh, watch it at like you know a quicker speed because it's a long video. But it's really a great video, and it, it really explains why Peter Risen is one of my favorite uh, cryptocurrency developers. Him and Craig Wright, I know they kind of hate each other, but they're both geniuses. Craig's a cunt, so I, I prefer Peter, but you know they're both geniuses, so I like them both. Um, but anyways, uh, in this uh, video, I want to explain to you guys uh, specifically um, about SPV and how you can use SPV to follow the longest proof of work chain and validate the longest proof of work chain using, you know, even 1800s level or era technology. So you could do this with Morse code and just like using paper and pen filing of information, and it's not even hard to do. Um, so what we're going to look at here is we're going to actually look at the proof of work chain here. So um, what I want to actually show you guys here, uh, first of all, is a proof of work chain that is being created. Um, so if we look at this, you have two block headers here, and a block header is all the information you need to validate a block within SPV. The way that SPV works is that um, a block header contains the, pre the previous hash, which is just the hash of the previous transaction, or the previous, uh, it's basically the previous block header. Um, so a hash of the last block header and the way if if you guys don't know this um, by now a hash function is just a one-way function where there's um, a nearly infinite number of possible outcomes and it's impossible to like it's just gonna going to be one of those random outcomes so within the SHA-256 hash it's called SHA-256 because there's two to the 256th power um, number of outcomes that are possible um, so that's obviously a massive number to raise to the 256th exponent you know that's that's much super that's super high um, so uh, the the reason that you use a hash function is because uh, in order to fake any any um, outcome of a hash function you need to try at least you know the number of possible outcomes in order to ensure that you will get a, a fake for whatever you're trying you know it, that's not it's not exactly I know it's variable even still but like you know there's a huge number of possible outcomes so you can't fake an outcome like if you have something if you put something in and it comes out to something in order to fake something or to put something else in that has the same outcome you have to try in it a nearly infinite number of uh, possibilities so you can't fake outcomes that's what a hash function is so if you have a hash of the previous block header you know that that hash is legitimate you can't fake that hash okay and so the way that the um, proof of work chain is built is that uh, inside this block header you have the hash of the previous transaction and you have a nonce and now a nonce is just a it's 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 a random variable. We'll cover that more in more detail later on. And you have the root root hash, and the root hash is all of the valid transactions. So if you look at the last completed root hash, the last completed root hash is all the transactions that receive their confirmations in that root hash. So the way that the root hash works is um, uh, the root hash, or I'm sorry, the root or the previous hash, the not or the way that all these three things work together, the previous hash, hash, the nonce, and the root hash, is that when you uh, when you hash all of this together, you get something that has a number of leading zeros. And if you look at the left side here in the yellow, that's the uh, the number of leading zeros is four here. So that's just the uh, proof of work. Okay. And so then to explain the proof of work here, uh, let's look at a block that is being made over on the right side. So the block on the right side, it's not completed yet. Um, but if we look at it again. Uh, and we're actually gonna we're gonna look at the block being made as it's completed, um, but below is just the root hash. The root hash is the number of valid transactions. So in this state, it's the mempool because nobody's validated a transaction. So the root hash just contains all the new transactions that were in the mempool. Like a miner just keeps adding all the transactions in the mempool into the root hash, and it just shows all the the valid transactions or the transactions that will validate when the next block is found. Okay, and so if we look now at um, 
after the next block is found, uh, if you look at the right side, that number there is the nonce. So the nonce here in this scenario, in this example that Peter Risen uses in this video, it's 45,873. That just means that it took the miner 45,873 tries to get a hash of the entire block header that had enough leading zeros, um, which is four in this example, which is shown above in yellow. And so the the proof of work in this one, the hash of the block header on the right side, it's 00008991. Okay. Now the way that a uh, the the nonce again over in the right side in the dark there, the nonce is uh, 45,873. Uh, the way that nonces work in Bitcoin is that the nonce is actually the miner's, uh, it's the miner's wallet address. So the miner just keeps creating random wallet addresses um, for, like, for themselves. And then when they find one that gets the correct, uh, the correct number of leading zeros uh, for the block header, that means that they can post that block header and they can claim their transaction, okay? Or they can claim claim the block reward, which is called the Coinbase transaction, and the block reward just goes directly into that wallet address that they just created, okay? The, the block reward and the fees, okay? And so that's how the proof of work chain is built. But again, to follow this, the the block header, the all it contains is the previous hash, the nonce, and the root hash. And the root hash, it works by uh, it's a really interesting function called a protocol, or sorry, not function called a protocol. It's a really interesting protocol called a Merkle tree or a Merkle root. And uh, we'll, we'll discuss that later, but you can actually tr check individual transactions and ensure that your individual transaction is in the uh, correct uh, proof of work blockchain. You can guarantee it uh, super quickly and it scales infinitely and we'll discuss that later. Right now we're just talking about following the proof of work chain. We're not going to show you how to verify your individual transaction yet. That's later on in the video. But again, th just to follow the proof of work chain, uh, let's examine what the node requirements are. So are there any scaling challenges with respect to just following this proof of work chain for your node? Um, the first thing you got to understand is that uh, the, your transactions sit outside the proof of work chain on your own, like whatever your device is, you have your own transactions, so you already have access to your transactions. You don't have to um, download everybody else's transactions. Um, so you don't, like, as long as you got the block header and the Merkle root, which is just, you know, the root hash, uh, as long as you have that, that's all you need. So there's no need to download all the transactions like everybody keeps saying there is. All you need is your SPV wallet to follow the proof of work chain, which is just 80 blocks every 10 minutes. So, or I'm sorry, not 80 blocks, 80 bytes every 10 minutes. If you had to, you guys, just so you know, you could, you could write this out on pen and paper and file it. So you can do this using, like, the ancient Egyptians could follow along on this. Now, to send this worldwide in enough sp in like with enough speed, you actually do need like 1800 technology. It might be before then, whenever Morse code was introduced, maybe I should have looked that up for this video, but uh, you can do this with Morse code with human operators who are just sending signals over electrical wire, you know, um, and they can do this very simply. It's not hard for them to follow along. So even if we go back, you know, hundreds of years in terms of technology, SPV still works. Just so you guys know, if you were to try to find the hashes uh, or if you were to find the proof of work for uh, Bitcoin using 1800s technology, the number of leading zeros would drop dramatically, so it would negatively affect the network. Um, but, but you know, we're, I'm not going to, I'm not going to actually seriously discuss that. But uh, anyways, the other thing we got to understand is that do, you know, you don't even have to get like everyone computers because a lot of the develop, developing world they don't have computers, but they do have smartphones. Like most people in the world have smartphones, so. You can connect most of the earth using Bitcoin Cash already. There's no scaling problems whatsoever. As, lo as far as following the proof of work chain, um, it can be done immediately. The one thing I do want to say about, like as a caveat, is if you do get the, uh, like the developing world is not going to add a huge amount of market cap compared as as compared to the developed world. Okay, the, the developed world, has, it's a much bigger market, so you want to capture that as well. Um, you don't like a lot of people oversell the developing world because you can't just bring Bitcoin to the developing world and expect it to develop the developing world. You know, you need people to go there to develop the developing world. Uh, it requires people too. You know, so just bringing Bitcoin to Africa or something like that, it's not going to make the price skyrocket. You have to bring people who can use Bitcoin within Africa. Um, you know, but and that's a completely different thing. 
Um, but moving on here, uh, the next thing we need to understand is how Bitcoin transactions work because again, like I said, if you, as long as you have your transaction and the hash of your transaction, you can check to see whether or not that transaction was, is within the, uh, or whether or not that transaction has confirmation. So again, uh, in order to undo proof of work blockchains, like to go back far in time, it's like super impossible. So if you, if you can reference your transaction to a transaction that is included in a block six days ago, um, you know, the, you can obviously tell that your transaction is valid because you can't undo proof of work for like six days. Like that's an insane amount of proof of work. So you can basically trust that transaction. And so that's how SPV works for validating your own transactions as you check certain train you only have to check certain individual transactions and check them against the main proof of work chain because again we said like we said w even with 1800s era level technology you can follow the main proof of work chain and so now we just use the merkle root and your own transaction so so long as you have the hash of a transaction so long as you check that against the merkle root you can check whether or not that transaction is valid and whether or not you can trust this transaction Okay, so in order to understand this, let's look at what a transaction is. So the first thing about a transaction here is first we have to understand what's going on. You have Alice's public key, you have a transaction, and or I'm sorry, you have a hash of the previous transaction that this transaction references, and then you have Zoe's signature. So what's actually going on here is Alice's public key is her wallet address. So Alice is actually the recipient in this transaction. The hash is, again, it's just of the previous transaction. And like we said, you can check transactions within the Merkle root um, to see whether or not they are included in the proof of work chain. And we're actually, that's the final piece we're going to cover in this section here. Um, but we're not going to go over the Merkle root. But a, or we're not going over the Merkle root yet, but just remember that that hash is just the hash of the previous transaction, and it's, you know, a hash is just a couple of bytes, and you, again, that's just used so you can check all the transactions involved with your own personal transactions uh, against the Merkle root without having to download all the transactions yourself. Okay, now if we look at Zoe's signature, what is Zoe's signature? Um, Zoe's the one who's sending the coins to Alice, so you need to include her signature, which is just a correlate, or it proves that she has the private key associated with the public key that, and again, if you go back to the previous transaction, Zoe's public key was, was just her wallet address, um, but her signature proves she has the private key of the wallet address of the previous transaction and so with these three pieces of information uh, you have everything you need in order to ensure that the entire chain of transactions proves that each owner of the, the previous owner of the coin also owned the private key and they sent it to this public key which is just the wallet address of the next person and you can validate this on the main proof of work blockchain um, and you can validate it very quickly because it all just uses hashes so let's let's move on now from just that single transaction to what happens if uh, Alice then wants to send the coin that she received from Zoe. Well, if Alice wants to send the coins that she received from Zoe, she and she wants to send them to Bob. Again, like we said, you just contain the hash of the previous transaction. So again, this hash it's the hash of the previous in the entire transaction, the public key or Alice's public key, the hash of the previous transaction, and Zoe's signature. So you're hashing three things within or all together, and that's included as the hash in this next transaction. You have Bob's public key, and Bob's public key is just his wallet address. So Alice wants to pay Bob, so she's she you know she has to send send it to a recipient and it, that's what the public key is and then you have Alice's signature and so again Alice's signature is just a way for her to publicly prove that she has the private key associated with the public key in the previous transaction and again the public key is just her wallet address so you have Alice proving she has the private key to her wallet address uh, from the previous transaction so this is all the information that Bob needs in order to prove to the next person that yes he is the valid owner of these Bitcoin Okay, and so the the main thing you got to remember here is since all you have here are ha the results of hashes, you have three hashes within a transaction, and then in order to reference the previous transaction, it's just a hash of those three things. So this is not much information, or this is not much information. The real question um, that is left here is. Uh, how much information does it take to do these uh, transactions? Um, your average transactions, it, it's 500 bytes. So again, this is. Uh, it you know it it's more than the 80 bytes for following the main proof of work blockchain. But how many transactions do you do in a day? Uh, you don't do you know if 
one transaction every 10 minutes your average person does not so it's only you're only going to do a few of these and you can do this all through text messages and you can do 500 bytes or receiving a transaction in 500 or you, re you can receive a transaction in three SMS messages um, I'm assuming, assuming the receiving a transaction is 500 bytes as well I don't know the differences between sending and receiving specifically um, but anyways uh, so everybody who uses cell phones right now they can do this okay if you were to receive three text messages worth of information that's not much and again most people wouldn't really receive it as text text messages but you can already do it through text messages just text messages alone like you you can reach everybody in the world um, but the other thing that I uh, want to point out here is that the only thing that uh, miners do a lot of people think that like you know miners make sure that the si like the system completely breaks down within miners the, what miners do is they eliminate the trust okay so when people talk about the decentralized and trustless nature of the blockchain miners just ensure that like all the all the SPV user has to do is they have to reference the proof of work and then so long as the proof of work is valid then they don't have to trust the users that came before them so if Alice Bob and Carol if they all trusted each other um, you know they don't have to actually use the proof of work blockchain okay and this is where off chain transactions come into play there are a lot of scenarios where you want to go off chain just to reduce fees um, like if you're doing a super high amount of volume of something you take it off chain but by definition anything you take off chain and you don't validate with the proof of work um, it's a trusted setup okay um, and so that's what miners are for it, it makes the entire system trustless and decentralized a lot of people get this wrong when they say it's centralized or you know different either you have to trust certain people within the network the only thing that's trustless and decentralized within Bitcoin it's the mining and it's the proof of work okay and so that's what the mining is for and that's what you reference your transactions against in order to prove that oh you know like if you've had six days worth of transactions there's so there's such a massive amount of proof of work uh, verifying your transaction that you can trust it even if you don't trust the person you're doing business with you can trust the coins you know that's what the point is you trust the you trust the math behind the system you don't trust the people um, but if you trust the people you can take it off chain um, but the, the the next thing we have to point out here is the relationship between uh, coin transfers your transactions and the proof of work chain built by the miners as it relates to the Merkle route so in this scenario here um, Let's assume we're including Bob's transaction that she gave to uh, Alice, um, and, and let's pretend like we're trying to uh, look at it within the entire blockchain. So the thing to remember about this uh, is that in the in an actual block, uh, there's a lot more transactions than this. So in this scenario, you're not going to see the massive scaling implications. But if we extend the blockchain, you'll see why the scaling implications like. A Merkle root allows for infinite scaling from an SPV standpoint. So from a user standpoint, you don't have to worry about scaling ever. Uh, so that's why you want to go with SPV like Bitcoin Cash did. It's it's very important. But w if you include Bob's transaction in a block where there's only four transactions, you start out, you have transaction zero, transaction one, transaction two, and then Bob's transaction. And the way computer counting works is they always start with zero. So zero is one for the rest of the world. Uh, that's just the way they do it. But then you, you hash each transaction. So you have hash zero, hash hash one, hash two, hash three, and hash three is Bob's transaction. So if Bob wants to check whether or not his transaction is in the full uh, blockchain, and again, the way that hashes work is whatever you put in when you hash it, it's going to come out to one thing and one thing only. It's a one-way function, and there's no way to duplicate or fake these hashes. So when Bob hashes his transaction, um, he's going to combine his tra or the hash of his transaction with the hash of transaction two, and that gives him the the result hash two three. Now, if either uh, transaction two or Bob's trans or if Bob's transaction was uh, altered at all, again, because all Bob cares about is his transaction. If Bob's transaction was altered at all, this would change the hash of hash two three. So, if there was someone screwing around with this system, so long as he's connected through SPV to the main blockchain, he would know that there is some sort of tampering within with his transaction and it's not a valid block you know he would know okay you cannot tamper with these transactions and because it will, will affect the root hash because then you know Bob hashes his transaction with hash 2 that turns into hash 2 3 and then if he transact or if he hashes 
uh, hash 23 with hash 01 and hash 01 is just the combinations of the hash of transaction 0 and the tra hash of sh hash 1 or transaction 1 um, he gets the root hash which is the hash of all transactions in this block now again the scaling implications don't seem like much here but if you actually do the math uh, if you're paying attention at each level so if, if Bob's trying to verify the hash of his own transaction actually let's let's do it in this example let's go to the hash of transaction one if we want to verify the hash of transaction one the first time that you hash it obviously you just hash your own transaction that's one calculation and hashes are they're very quick functions it doesn't take much processing power at all it's very easy to do so you hash your transaction easy to do okay so you have your transaction hashed after you hash your own transaction um, you're gonna hash it with a transaction of equal size right so that's another that's another or you have to look at you have to have the hash of the other transaction and then you hash those together so at that point though what you have to realize is you've just doubled the size of your hash, okay? So the next time that you hash your transaction together, you're hashing it with a hash that is double the size of your original transaction. So each time you hash, the next hash is double the size, okay? And this is why it allows for infinite scaling because it, technically speaking, it scales, uh, the, I think the computer science term that they use is that they say it scales logarithmically, and logarithmically is the, uh, it's the inverse of exponentially. So like I said uh, with, um, the way that the Bitcoin Lightning mesh network, the rooting problem, like it gets worse, it gets exponentially worse as you scale. Uh, the or verifying SPV transactions gets logarithmically worse as you scale, and logarithmically just means like, you know, the the it keep, like you can get larger and larger, and uh, the amount of resources needed to or added on it keeps getting less and less so the number of transactions per block verifying your own transaction if there's only four transactions per block like I said the number of bytes for it it's pretty high it's 64 okay um, if you go up to 32 transactions per block that's 160 bytes so that doesn't seem like a huge improvement but if you go up to a thousand transactions per block it's 320 bytes okay so that's what logarithmic scaling means is that as you keep, like you keep getting bigger and bigger and the number of bytes doesn't really increase you can go up to a million transactions that's 640 bytes okay so you just increase the number of transactions by three orders of magnitude but you only doubled the number of bytes that are required for proving that your transaction is included in the Merkle root because of it, the fact that it logarithmically scales and if we go back to this picture again all you're doing is you look at one leaf of the tree but and you combine one leaf with another leaf and when you combine the leaf with the second leaf that doubles the size of your leaf and then you can combine that leaf that is now twice as big with a leaf that is or try the, the, the secondary leaf with which is twice as big as your original leaf you combine with another leaf that is twice as big as your original leaf and so that's just why the it keeps scaling logarithmically and get it gets better and better at scale like you can t there's technically speaking like logarithmically there's unlimited scaling. Like when you have something that scales logarithmically, like this does, you you basically say it has lo it has unlimited scaling because right? it basically does. Computers are going to increase much faster than the scaling limits on SPV wallets is ever going to increase. So the scaling on SPV it's unlimited. Okay, and so this is a big point that a lot of people don't understand. Um, you know, I would look up Merkle roots yourselves. Uh, I don't have the highest quality. Um, video content uh, with my videos and you can get a better understanding of Merkle roots through different videos that di different people have out there but if you understand a Merkle root and how it works like this is how Bitcoin scaling works uh, the final thing I want to put out there as a little sort of tease of a video I've got coming up is the the reason that or the the way that Bitcoin scales using these Merkle roots is also the reason why um, <clears throat> I like I recently posted the comment that memo.cash and the other blockchain based um, Twitters or whatever that are trying to pop up that say they're uncensorable and stuff they're terrible because they don't use hashes and they don't use Merkle roots uh, for scaling and proving uncensorability like we said before if you try and tamper with anything that's contained in a Merkle root it changes the final like the entire outcome of the Merkle root so uh, like if you want to provide an, uh, a, a, an, an uncensorable version version of Twitter the best way to do it is actually to do a proof of work side chain within the Bitcoin Cash blockchain uh, that uses Merkle roots and hashes to prove that it's sensor proof. And it, like I'll go, I'm, I'm going to make a video on this, but and I don't, I don't know specifically the direction that 
memo.cache is trying to go, but the, like everything that I see being posted on Reddit, like everyone's trying to do applications on Bitcoin wrong. Okay, you can do like proof of work blockchains within the Bitcoin Cash blockchain itself. Okay, one thing that I've talked about before in a lot of videos and a lot of comments is the the fact that the block reward on Bitcoin Cash is going to drop to the point where it might not finance the network within like 10 years, but you can still create proof of work blockchains within the Bitcoin Cash blockchain that can sort of make up for that and it's proof of work within the Bitcoin Cash ecosystem. So that's like it's not it's not a fractional reserve like take fees away from miners thing like the Lightning Network is. It's just like make more fees in different manners for miners, like SHA-256 miners. It's really weird. It's really weird. The things you can do with Bitcoin are really weird, but people are building applications wrong on top of it. So I want to talk about how to fix memo.cache in one of these upcoming videos. But if you can understand Merkle roots, uh, it's all through basically hashes and Merkle roots. Like Merkle roots are an insane thing that most people don't understand. So I love that Peter Risen is really pushing this stuff. And again, this video that I made, it's uh, completely coming from different things. Or like I just I took it from Peter Risen. It's, it was a great video by Peter Risen. It only had 25 views the first time I saw it. And I wanted to spread it because I think I can get more than 25 views. And if you guys can understand this, like you need to start spreading the word, the word because people don't understand Merkle Roots. But um, Anyways, one other thing I want to say is I want to give a big thanks to uh, all the people who have uh, who have donated to me. Um, I just randomly checked my Bitcoin Cash wallet again recently, and it's not like I'm getting a lot of donations. I, I got like 30 bucks worth, but when I think of that in terms of like, you know, it's like one fiftieth of a Bitcoin Cash that I had. It's probably not 30 bucks right now. It's less than that, but because the price has dropped recently, but. You know, it, it felt it, like it feels pretty good. And the other thing that I want to say is I want to give a big thanks to this community because like, I can tell we're one of the smartest communities within the Bitcoin Cash ecosystem because I see you guys around within like on different places, whether it's on Twitter or Reddit. Like I, I view a lot of things within the community and I can see the names of people who are, you know, post regularly here. And you guys are definitely among the smartest community uh, within, or, you know, like we're a sub community. We're a very small community within Bitcoin Cash, but a lot of the people who are regular here are, you know, I see them around and you guys, uh, like it. You represent this community well, I guess. What I wanted to make was just, uh, you know, videos that condense a lot of like a high volume intelligent discussion and when I see your guys' discussion outside of my YouTube channel it's always really great so that's really cool um, yeah the main thing I would say to you guys is if you can just spread the word to people you know that's, that's the best thing you can do but uh, anyways there will be more videos coming out soon I'm going to make that video on memo.cash and why it's terrible and why they're building it completely wrong and again I'm not completely familiar with the development path of memo.cash so like I hope they can fix it I hope they're working on fixing it right now so I'm not the one who has to like advise them on what to do but you guys should really look into Merkle Roots if you don't understand them. Even if you understand them, try to make sure you understand them fully because Merkle Roots are the craziest thing within the Bitcoin ecosystem. And if you're not building applications within Bitcoin using hashes and Merkle Roots, then for the most part, you're probably building them wrong. But anyways, uh, that video, video will be coming out soon. I hope you enjoyed this one.